You don't have to have fishing licenses in New Zealand? No, you can just grab a rod, do whatever you want and go fishing, yeah. It seems like everything you do is basically DIY or solo. Summer is coming up and I've got one thing on my mind and that is a marlin. It was like the most delectable bite of fish I've ever had. It was it was just incredible. Like you could still taste the sea. But it has been the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. Today, we're joined by someone who truly embodies the spirit of the outdoors. She's an angler, a hunter, and a fierce advocate for the outdoor lifestyle. Known online as She Hooks and Hunts, she's built a strong community around her passion for fishing, hunting, and the wild experiences that come with them. We're excited to dive into her adventures, learn what drives her, and give some insights into the world of outdoor sports from her unique perspective as a beginner in New Zealand. Welcome, She Hooks and Hunts. Honestly, so true. It's like when I'm fishing. And I turn off the camera and then next minute my reel is on and it's like, and then I I get nothing on camera. (laughs) It seems to always happen that way. Yeah. Yeah. Building fishing is so difficult because you don't know when they're going to strike. You don't know, you know, what angle they're going to be hitting from or where you're casting at. It's like, you have, you basically have to have a 360 camera going at all times to even capture. (laughs) hundred percent. And like, nobody has that kind of data storage, you know, in the the camera. Exactly. And then you edit through those. That takes hours. It's it's just impossible. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a 360 camera that I've used one time on a fishing trip. And I said never again. Because <laughs> it's just, you have so much to go through. And then the program. So this was when I think GoPro first came out with their first 360 camera. And this was years ago. And the user interface of the editing program was horrible. So I just haven't oh, even touched it since. Oh. But. Yeah, it's uh, sure. not, not for me for sure. <laughs> yeah, I've actually just gotten a DJI, so I've moved away from mm-hmm. GoPro just to test it out. It's actually good quality, so I'm going to give that a go. But I uh, I went fishing the other day. This massive wave hit me the day after I bought my DJI. Mm-hmm. Completely lost it. And then really? next oh, morning, no. like a, kilometer away, a kilometer away, floating away from me, and I was land-based fishing. I didn't have a boat. So <laughs> if anyone oh, finds sorry. that, they'll open up the camera with some, like, awesome fishing. <laughs> 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 yeah. Are you using the DJI Osmos? Uh, not an Osmo. This one was, like, an Action 4, one of their new ones. I see. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, really. Good. I didn't even know DJI started making action cameras. Dude, they have action cameras. They they actually have these tiny little um, action cameras there, and then they have some that are very similar size to the GoPros. I've contemplated going over yeah. to DJI for that reason. Oh, hmm. so good! And they don't like, apparently they don't have the overheating problem that the GoPros do. Because ah, GoPros seem to overheat all the time. I filmed a video in Oklahoma that I'm actually released, or I just released it 30 minutes ago. Um, and, (laughs) and my GoPro died like on, so I went fishing and camping the first night and then fished the second day and then went home after that. And on the first night it, it died. No, it overheated while I was out trout fishing and didn't get footage of me catching the fish that I wanted to do the catch and cook with. Um, luckily I was able to set up my phone and kind of get a little footage and make way. And then the second day it died and I caught my first smallmouth buffalo. And I didn't even oh, have it on camera. So same thing. I set up my phone on my backpack and just tried to make shift with it. But yeah, it was those DJI's or the uh, GoPro seem to overheat all the time. So mm-hmm. I've heard DJI doesn't have that problem. Interesting. I haven't used it enough. So I will be letting you know. <laughs> <if it's not. laughs> I would appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I'm definitely it's- thinking about changing over. And their drones are amazing too. So to have it all on the same platform would be awesome. Yeah, exactly. And I use their app as well to edit some of their videos. Mm-hmm. My videos, incredible app. Like I'm actually very really? happy. With it. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I used my iPhone the other day because I I have never caught a land based fish up until that point, like a few weekends ago. Really? And it's it's yeah, it's embarrassing. It's been like my what is it called? Like my nemesis? Is that the is that the <laughs> word? I honestly have gone land based fishing, and I always go solo, you know. But the one time I went with someone, he just taught me how to properly rig up a line. Mm-hmm. 
for land-based snapper and we were stray lining. Um, and my phone completely overheated, shut off, lost all the data. And oh, that, no. that day when I caught my sucks. first land-based snapper and I was going to show everyone because it's such an amazing accomplishment, at least for me. Um, lost all the data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Rough. I know. It definitely sucks. is. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned earlier that you're from South Africa, but you live in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been in New Zealand for? So I moved here seven years ago um, and it's a completely different world. Like I was telling Joe just before um, the start of recording that, you know, I, South Africa, you're open to safariing and four by fouring and like everything is just danger. You know, you've got lions walking next to your tent Especially, especially about Botswana. It's where we went camping all the time in the wild. Uh-huh. Like it's so cool. And the thing that you're most, the most dangerous animal there, more so than a lion, is actually a hippo. Isn't that really? funny? That's yeah, because they run so fast. So that's so just crazy stories. And then New Zealand is just the safe, safe, safe environment. Nothing can kill you. No, nothing is poisonous apart from <laughs> one spider. Um, so it's a perfect place to go hunting and fishing and it's just, yeah, opened up a whole new world for me, really. Mm. That's awesome. So did you start fishing and hunting yourself when you moved to New Zealand or did you do some of that in, in Africa as well? Yeah. So my dad growing up was a massive ocean fisherman. So we owned like a, a holiday house on an island called Mozambique, beautiful, mm-hmm. beautiful country. Um, and yeah, he, I, I would always, you know, cast a rod out, but he would always line up my my reel and help me out with all those things. I loved it, but I wasn't addicted to how I am now. I um, see. Yeah. And then my dad passed away when I was 12, 13. Um, and then we decided to move to New Zealand um, a few years after that. And I've never, ever hunted in my life before, ever. But then I had a partner who bought me a bow for Christmas. <laughs> and I was like, this is just the weirdest thing. I didn't even know that bows exist. I've never <laughs> used a gun or rifle in my life. I've never killed an animal in my life. I just was so, I used to be vegan. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and not like, I wasn't ever like an animal activist vegan. Like I just mm-hmm. did that for health reasons. I mean, I had I deer head on my deer heads on my wall and a cow skin carpet um but yeah it was just a new life to me and then three months after that um he was yeah he 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 cheated on me and I was like oh no got to break up with him and um I was like okay what do I do now I'm by myself you know no one's take me fishing no one to teach me how to use this odd object that's in my room which is a compound bow (laughs) and uh, I went direct to Facebook and I think Facebook is so amazing because there's so many communities and, ev- and like events that, you know, Facebook host. Mm-hmm. And I reached out to a bunch of people. I said, hey, I've got this bow. Can someone teach me how to use it? And I think in that group, it was like one of the most engaged, liked, uh, commented photo that they've ever had. Um, and I was like, wow. okay, this is, wow, what, an, what, an, what a community, you know? Right. I think it helps being a woman. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and yeah, I just had so many people reach out. And from there, I became addicted, addicted. It's just, you feel so free. I can talk about it for hours. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm still, still in that learning process. For sure. I'm still very much a beginner. That was five months ago. And my oh, life wow. Was- so wow. you're like new into it. I'm new, new, new. I've only killed three goats <laughs> ever. <I see. laughs> yeah. That yeah. That's crazy. I, I thought you'd been doing it for a while. I, yeah. <laughs> Fishing, um, you know, I've always gone in people's boats every now and then, but actually learning how to do it myself and tying knots and all of that stuff, like five months ago, used YouTube, asked people. And that's why I started She Hooks and Hunts five months ago. I Only see. reason was just to meet people and yeah. to, to, to just learn. And it's, yeah, I've definitely done that. <laughs> that is yeah. so cool. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to have you on here is because it seems like everything you do is basically DIY or solo. And 
we've had numerous conversations about like hunting is is a lot harder to get into and be successful than fishing. Uh, there's just a lot more to it and you seem to be doing well at it. So I kind of wanted to dive into that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I get questions all the time. How did you get into bow hunting? Obviously getting a gun license is quite difficult. And I'm in that process now at the moment, but there's something quite special about bow hunting is that you don't need a license in New Zealand. Is it the I same for America? Uh, no, you still have to have a hunting license regardless. There's not a difference between like a rifle license or a bow license. You just have to have a hunting license. Okay. And then you have to have your firearm safety if you have like, if you want to hunt rifles and pistols and stuff. And I think, it, and I think it's a lot of it depends on the state too. Like I think in Texas, there's a, in addition to the hunting license, if you want to bow hunt, I believe you have to have an archery endorsement if I'm not mistaken. So that's like an, an additional thing. But, um, Usually, like we, at, le- like, at least in Texas, we have what's called a super combo, which is probably the most popular package. And if it includes your hunt, all your hunting stuff, pretty much like all your tags, all your endorsements, it includes wow. saltwater and freshwater um, licenses and some drum tags. Pretty much everything you need, except if you want to do public land hunting, that's an additional thing you have to buy in addition to the, to the license. Yeah. It's quite yeah. um there's quite a few things that you need just to go fishing as well. Just a licenses mm-hmm. for everything. <laughs> We're quite yeah, lucky yeah. in New Zealand. Yeah. You don't have to have um, fishing licenses in New Zealand? No. For the South Island you do for trout fishing. Um like okay. water lake fishing. But in the North Island, no. You can just grab a rod, do whatever you want and go fishing. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Wow. Same with Yeah, fishing. in Texas you have to have a license for freshwater and salt water. They're separate. And then you have to have, like, you can buy additional tags if you want to keep oversized drum and stuff. In Arkansas, you have to have a fishing license, and then you have to have additional stamps if you want to keep trout and stuff like that. Yeah. No way. That's insane. Yeah. Well, so, like, oh. kind of to, to add on to what Russell said, so in Texas, yeah, the, there's fresh water and salt water that are separate, but then there is, yeah. like, an all-water thing where you can buy, like, for, for everything. So, like, if you oh, yeah. will, so if you're, like, if you live inland, but you want to maybe if you take the occasional trip throughout the year to the coast, you can just buy them um, by the all water. And it's only like five bucks more or 10 bucks more than the fresh water. Whereas if you bought them separately, it would be like, I don't know, probably almost 70 or 80 bucks. So it'd be cheaper just to buy the all water. But yeah, okay. it's, it's very, yeah, it's very interesting. Like all, and that's just Texas and every state has their own regulations. They have their own prices. So um, if you're going to like, if you're going out of state to go fish, you got to make sure, and they have their own like, uh, link limits, size limits, bag limits, all that stuff. So it's crazy. Like I went to visit Russell one time in Arkansas, I had to get my fishing license and then I think I had to get a trout permit, which is like an extra, I forget how much, like 13 like bucks, or, bucks something. or something. Yeah. For an out of state, it was like 13 bucks or 18 bucks. Can't remember. And then, um, I think that was it just for us to be able to go fishing for trout. If we weren't targeting trout. I didn't have to buy that, but there's, you know, certain oh. places where you have to have it. It's just so, it's crazy. It's overwhelming I, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, and, and you know, if I had to travel there, I just wouldn't know those things. I just probably mm. would have fished anyway, not thinking, but good to know because I, I definitely like, I've always had America on my mind. Um, yeah. It's not, quite a bit of my following is actually in our Americans, particularly really? from okay. Texas. Yeah. Really? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, you guys love hunting. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do love yeah. hunting. Yeah, yeah, sure. and I, I, yeah. So I really love that, and I've, I've always, you know, watched documentaries of a lot of American bow hunters, and yeah, I've, I've learned a lot essentially from American fishermen as well, and the kind of knots to tie, and how you know, especially Florida as well. It's like a dream mm, yeah. for fishing there, game fishing, you know. Proper game fishing, um, right? Tarpon, yeah, it's permit, a lot of snook, yeah. redfish. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, what yeah. species do you typically target over there in New Zealand? So, snapper and kingfish, I would say, is like a a common fish that someone would catch, um, especially on the North Island. Kingfish is still like there's still a challenge to a kingfish, and especially getting a really good like thirty kg one, which is a a huge kingfish 
Um, but, you know, I am still new to fishing, so I'm learning about different size limits and, and, and really what other species are out there. But I know that summer is coming up and I've got one thing on my mind and that is a marlin. I want a marlin oh, so bad. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, marlin and a swordfish would be, I'm, like, I would be so happy if I got that on a big fish, yeah. you know? <laughs> Those are two fish that I would love to catch. There's so many big fish that are off the coast because I live like 10 hours from the coast. Maybe I think I could probably get to the coast in about nine hours, the closest spot. Um, But Florida is definitely the pinnacle for saltwater fishing in the U.S. Uh, If you're Mm -hmm. you're going for big game fish, marlin and stuff like that. And uh, I'll make it happen someday for sure. Yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, There's a few game boats out there that have done so well. Bluefin tuna fishing is also massive. Only recently in New really? Zealand. So they've always traveled up the coast. Um, but I think an influencer about five years ago actually just told people about them. They were like, guys, we've got big bluefin tuna swimming up the coast of New Zealand. This is like one of the most expensive fish you can buy, one of the most tastiest fish. Why are we not fishing for them? And it just blew up within five years. Now it's like the biggest thing ever uh, really? during about three, four months of the season. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dang, so I caught it. Yeah. I think it was one of the, my biggest fish I've ever caught, which was like around about an 80 to 85 kg bluefin. That's a good <laughs> Is that the one you have pinned on your Instagram? Yeah. That thing is massive. <laughs> yeah. How long, how long did it take you to get that in? About 45 minutes. Jeez. Yeah. That's yeah. Insane. It was so much fun and i've i've smoked it i've made poke bowls like i've given oh, the fish away yeah yeah there. they're so mm-hmm. good eh? <laughs> i'll say it's um, caught tuna but it was yellowfin wasn't it uh man yes i think so um but it was years ago and that's my the one and only time i ever went but it was really cool um when we got back to the dock the captain he started filleting all the fish and uh, he's like, dude, you ever had fish straight? You know, like as, as soon as we get back, I was like, no, nah, never. So he's like, you got to try this. So he's filleting it and he gives me a piece. I don't remember where he cut it from, but it was essentially sashimi. But it was like the most delectable bite of fish I've ever had. It was it was just incredible. Like you could still taste the sea. It was just the best fish I've ever had in my life to this day. It was incredible. Tuna so yeah. good. But especially when yeah. it's like that fresh. Oh, yeah. There's literally nothing better than the freshest of the fresh. It's yeah. like, um, I think a big goal for me is is killing a deer and then eating its heart. I Like, I would cook it up, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, cook it up, and apparently that is, like, unbelievable because it doesn't need a rest. Um, so, yeah, it's actually a really big thing in New Zealand here. People always cook really? up the heart, and yeah, yeah. I've really heard of, of people in African countries doing it uh, on safari hunts and stuff like that with certain animals, but I've uh, I've actually never harvested a deer myself. Um, but I've heard that it's it's a it's a delectable thing to eat is the heart. Yeah, yeah, really meaty. Um, I've eaten a bluefin tuna heart, which is actually not that bad. Interesting, really. <laughs> you, you, you have to. It's your first bluefin tuna you catch. It's like a rite of passage. <laughs> oh, I, I missed out because we didn't. The dude just threw it in the water. We never had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> no way. It's, it's such yeah. a mad experience because you get this massive fish on the boat. Obviously, you kill it. You let it bleed out because you have to with those fish. And then you cut its heart out, and it's still beating. Like while you're looking at this fish in front of you, and you you just you have to eat it. You have to rip into it. (laughs) (laughs) That's insane. Yeah, it's a crazy experience, and it actually didn't taste that bad. It was pretty good, actually. Really, that sounds (laughs) pretty intense. I've only eaten two hearts before. One was of a snake, and one was of a rabbit. Um, That is so cool. There, it's weird because it's it's just like a piece of meat like I, I expected something different but it's essentially just like a piece of meat and we i ate both of those raw i didn't cook them or anything but uh oh, wow. yeah it's a uh, it's it's different than what i expected but it's not bad but then again i mean the hearts of those are you know tiny yeah so i'm sure a bluefin heart or a deer heart would be far yeah. different <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Well, how did a snake heart taste like didn't really have much of a taste. It's almost like you taste the blood more than you taste the actual meat. 
I mean, it's like the size of your pinky nail, and you just feel the oh, texture really, and it doesn't really have much flavor. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure if you were to like season it or, or cook it on an open flame or something and give it a little bit more to it, but it's just almost, I mean, I don't really, really know how to describe it. Maybe an unseasoned steak. I, okay. I, I really don't know. Yeah, it doesn't really have sense. much of a taste. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be a reason why the, like wolves and animals always eat the organs first. And it's always the alpha male of the pack that gets mm-hmm. put to the organs and then the rest of the pack eats the meat. Yeah. Um, I'm always trying to eat the organs first. Like it, it really is the most nutrient packed of mm-hmm. the oh, animal. For sure. I know that a lot of animals, uh, predatory animals in specific, will eat. I think it's like the kidneys or the liver because it's the most protein and the most carbs in the smaller package. Um, so I think in the case of wolves, because they're pretty active animals, they want to have, you know, get more from it with less weight weighing them down. And so I think True. that's why the alpha gets it. True. Actually, liver's not bad. I've eaten um, chicken <laughs> livers. Yeah, <laughs> like, I've had chicken uh, liver. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Cook it up in peri-peri. That's a very South African dish. <laughs> really? What's peri-peri? <laughs> Peri peri! Oh my gosh, I'm about to change your lives. So <laughs> peri peri is like it's like a it's a very traditional Portuguese style uh, chili sauce, mm-hmm, and some yeah. of it can be quite crinkly. Do you guys have Nando's in the in the US? I don't I so. never heard of that. What what is that? It's just a restaurant, and it, they're like known for their peri peri. I kid you not, go research Peri Peri after this, make up a recipe, you will thank me later. <laughs> so That's a spell. Um, P E R I, and then double that to Peri Peri. Okay. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I already found a couple of recipes, and that is definitely going to be happening soon. I love making <laughs> different kinds of like ethnic foods and different curries and stuff like yeah. that. And uh, that's actually one of my favorite things when it comes to food is just trying things from different countries. Um, Mm -hmm. Last time we were in Houston, didn't we go to like, it was like a Jamaican restaurant or something like that, Jose, wasn't it? Yeah, we had some, I think, jerk chicken, I think it was. Yeah. So so I'm always trying to try different cuisines from different countries. So that's definitely on the list. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And jerk chicken is like, that's mean. Like in in New Zealand saying, we say mean as in like, that's good. (laughs) So a bit of the slang will come through. But um, I was in Jamaica actually once and it was the first Mm -hmm. time I ever had uh, jerk chicken. And I said, this is honestly the most incredible sauce. So I use that all the time actually in my in my cooking. Really? Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. jerk chicken. I've I've only tried to make it once, and I don't think it came out nearly as authentic as I thought it did. I, I mean, I thought it tasted <laughs> amazing until we went to that place in Houston, and yeah, that uh, people incredible. that were there working, like you could tell that they were they were actually from Jamaica, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that food tasted way different than what I made, but it was so good. <laughs> it always does, eh? It always does. Exactly. Yeah. In that same vein, you mentioned earlier that you really like goat curry. So is that, uh, how, I guess what would be a good, is that like a good way to prepare goat? Because I've only Mm -hmm. had goat a few times in my life and I did not Mm -hmm. enjoy any of them at all. Yeah. It was just, (laughs) it was not, not good to me personally, but. It's funny, like goat is such an underrated dish, I think, um, and such underrated meat, I mean. So it's funny because goat goat steak is just, you just don't touch, you just don't do that. Like that is just a bit weird with goat, I find. Um, And as a new bow hunter, you know, targeting deer was quite difficult because they they get spooked very easily. I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So goat is a lot easier animal to target. And I'm the kind of person that I hunt to eat. I don't hunt just to kill. Um, And I knew that I just had to use this meat somehow. And I came across a lot of slow cooked meal options. And um, I find that goat definitely, especially when you slow cook it, it's more like a meatier style lamb. Lamb is quite fatty. Mm. We've got a lot more leaner and meatier. So when you mix spices and, you know, you make like an Indian curry with that, oh my gosh, it really is. It's yum. It's so good. Yeah, really, really that. yeah. I even once uh, got a little bit more courage instead of doing slow cook. I actually slow roasted a, a goat leg, which sounds so gross to some people. <laughs> um, I mean, I brought it into the office here, and 
you know, nobody here hunts at all. But they were like, oh, like, why are you eating goat? But actually, it's one of the most eaten, widely eaten meats in the whole of the world. Mm-hmm. I never knew that until someone I didn't that. either. Yeah. So I tried a goat leg roast. Unbelievable. Like, unbelievable. Wow. And I really? got game with everyone. They were raving about it. You just got to cook it right. Marinate it well. Um, well slow cooker so it's really tender you've got to rest the meat for a while in the fridge because if you don't like it's really tough um mm. so i've got a got a goat in the fridge right now that i killed <laughs> five days ago so i think it's ready to cook up now yeah interesting <laughs> yeah. so what do you marinate it with um so i i like the indian spices so yogurt with a bit of um like turmeric, lots of garlic, masala powder, all of that stuff. Yeah. I see. So, yeah, I do the same thing with my chicken. I'll take uh like a a regular Greek yogurt and I'll put some turmeric in it and I'll put I have some curry powder, some spicy curry powder and some garlic and uh garam masala is another seasoning that I like to use and uh mm-hmm. coriander is another one and anise and I'll I'll mix it all together and I'll blend oh, it, yeah. get it almost whipped. I'll soak my chicken in it, let it soak overnight. And then take it out, brown it in, in a hot skillet, and then bake it yes. and finish cooking it. Oh, Making oh. myself hungry here. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost dinner time for you, isn't it? <laughs> I know, right? It is. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so goat, like you said that. goat is widely eaten around the world. Is goat widely eaten there in New Zealand as well? Because I know there's quite no. a bit of them there, aren't there? There are, but like not at all. So actually, New Zealand, especially for sheep as well, we actually export most of our stock, really. So hmm, I see. all the lamb, I, re- I actually rarely see people eat lamb here. Meanwhile, they're like, there's more than humans, as mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, I see people eating lots of steaks here, lots of chicken. I, I was the first person I knew that ate goat here. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, yeah. But then, you know, as as mentioned, I've only recently just joined the hunting community, and and they mm-hmm. they really go hard on on the deer, on venison. I see, and pig mm-hmm. as well. You know, pork sausages, and um, yeah, all, all the pig recipes that they eat. I, I haven't I haven't hunted a pig yet, but it's definitely a goal for me. Nice. I see. So, what species of deer do y'all have there? Oh, this is going to challenge me because I I'm still trying to learn. <laughs> Fallow is is one red deer, um, and that's all. That's all really I know. But there's so more. There's so much more. <laughs> um, hmm. But be, like I came across the most beautiful fallow stag the other, the other day on my hunt, um, and it was just unbelievable. Beautiful antlers that went right back. They panned out, and I've never seen a stag like that before. Beautiful mm-hmm. back with just like white spots on it. It's crazy how their their coat changes in different seasons. Just unbelievable. Yeah. And I think being a hunter, I've appreciated animals more so than ever. The irony, right? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and just because you really sit with them in nature, and and you're, you're just there with them. You're you have to be quiet to stalk them. You, you you have to understand the wind, the smells. Like it's just amazing like why don't every why doesn't everyone hunt um and i came so close this deer but unfortunately not close enough um and my friend actually had a rifle there so we decided to use the rifle not the bow Mm because there was a cheeky goat right next to the deer that if i stalked it with the bow that goat would have you know saw me and probably feared away the goat uh the deer and um took a shot at it unfortunately it just got far too low as it was moving away which is the worst thing for a hunter um Mm -hmm. but something you just have to go you know you you go through um and yeah shot its leg ran away my friend quickly grabbed the rifle shot it again definitely was a liver shot because there was quite a bit of foam in the blood that we saw while we were tracking and we tracked this deer for about eight hours across two days, just oh, up wow. and down those mountains, those ridges. We just didn't give up um, and just couldn't find us, which is so interesting. Must have yeah. really ran quite far. So, yeah, that le- le- left me with a terrible feeling. Um, yeah. But I'm happy that it did die. I just really wish I could have used that meat and, and at least for that beautiful head, you know. Right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, every hunter goes through it. Every hunter has shot an animal that they haven't been able to retrieve. Yeah. So you're not alone in that. 
but yeah. it does suck that it was such a fine specimen of a stag. Yeah. You you hunt long enough. It's, it's not a matter of if, but when. That stuff just happens, unfortunately. So, so true. Yeah. Someone told me cause there's a lot of culling that's happening right now in New Zealand. Really, deer is a pest here. Um, really? hmm. so they, yeah, absolutely. So, so they're in need of colors, and we're just getting rid of, you know, the, you know, the growth that we've had in deer numbers. Um, and they said, look, if it wasn't me, it would have been a color. Um, so that made me feel a little bit better, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it sounds like me and Jose need to make a trip to New Zealand then because yeah. uh, I know y'all have some good trout fisheries there too. <laughs> <laughs> Something I need to actually get into. I've been eyeing out trout fishing and fly fishing and all of that. Mm-hmm. So, oh, fly fishing. That, that's what me and Jose do. We are we, we fly fish more than anything else. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you're in a place that you would probably absolutely love it. So yeah. you should try it. <laughs> I think yeah. I will. Someone told me. I think we're like there's like we're one of the best countries to do it in. Apparently. Yeah, some of the best in the world. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And, and, uh, and ironically cool. enough, it's kind of so in comparison to hunting. So rifle hunting, I would say, is more like the conventional fishing, and I would say fly fishing is probably more of the equivalent to bow hunting when it comes to hunting okay. and fishing. Um, it's a lot more intimate, you know you typically can't cast as far. Uh, you normally mm-hmm. have more of an intimate relationship with the fish because a lot of it is sight casting rather than just throwing out a lure or bait to bring it in. Um, it's just yeah, more yeah. of an intimate thing. And then mm-hmm. on top of that, the rods are a lot more lightweight than a typical conventional rig. So you're going to feel the head shake more. You're going to oh, feel the weight of the fish a little oh, more. So um, yeah, I would, I would compare it kind of like bow hunting compared yeah. to rifle hunting. Uh, even just oh, like, yeah. even just like the process of casting, it's like everything's intentional. You know, the like the mm-hmm. angle of the rod, how much force you're applying and all that stuff. It's kind of like, you know, you're uh, in archery when you're trying to find your anchor point, make sure you're good, your breathing's good, make sure your bow is nice and straight, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You're not torquing it too much. It's just a lot of things need to be intentional about in order for you to execute a good shot or make a good cast. It's, there's a lot of parallels. Mm-hmm. I think that's why it appeals to um, one or the other. I, I feel, I, I find people who, like to bow hunt typically really like to fly fish and vice versa it's kind of okay. interesting how that pans out. I need to get involved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i i think i i think it, it does look very attractive because it sounds very technical it um, is. and very challenging you know apparently you need to use different flies because of the different seasons and when the bugs are, like, are coming to play i don't i've heard that from someone yeah, um, you can make your own flies. Like it seems like a beautiful intimate sport. Um, it is for sure. How do I get yeah. started? <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I don't <laughs> know what y'all have in terms of stores or fly shops or anything there. Um, but a lot of local fly shops, if y'all have any there, will typically mm-hmm. have a setup that you can buy. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll normally be a lower end rod, reel, and fly line combo. And if you go in there, a lot of the fly shops will let you cast them. A lot of them offer casting lessons to kind of get you started. Um, and I mean, being from the U.S. and not knowing anything about New Zealand in terms of flies, I couldn't really point you in a direction. But yeah. typically, you know, the the phrase is match the hatch. So whatever bug is hatching there, is, you want to try to use a fly that looks like that or imitates that. Mm-hmm. Um, or there's also streamers, which are like little, they they imitate little fish or uh, there's craw patterns, which would imitate a crawfish. Um, so it really depends on regionally mm-hmm. what flies you would use. Um, but I would I would recommend just going to a local fly shop if there's any yeah. there, and they can definitely okay. point you in the right direction. Okay, amazing. I will. I will. And YouTube too. Like there's a uh, Mad River Outfitters. They have a oh, absolutely. bunch of videos on like how to cast and different types of casts and things like that. Like uh, I'm all okay. self taught. I didn't I didn't go. I should have gone to a fly shop. Um, I probably picked up some bad habits <laughs> along the way, you know, but uh, I'm all self-taught and YouTube was my best friend and uh, just, you know, practicing just kind of like you'd practice with your bow. And uh, mm. honestly, Facebook's a really good resource too. Like I've met a bunch of really good people on Facebook. Um, mm. One of our buddies, Marco, he's been on the podcast a few times. I met him on Facebook in some fishing group and we now we're like really good fishing buddies and stuff. Uh, shout out Marco mm-hmm. if you if you if you're listening to this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Facebook is a really good resource too. Uh, yeah, that's probably and uh, like and yeah, just what Russell said. Go, I mean, if 
if you're able to find a good fly shop or something like that, there, I mean, they will save you some trouble for sure. Helping you yeah. get set up and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, I think I know exactly the shop that I need to visit. I I think especially finding people passionate in the sport, they mm-hmm. they want to help, and that's what I've found with fishing and hunting. You know, and it's quite funny. Like I, you know, I've I've reached out to um women hunting groups and women fishing groups, and everything, and the help there is actually being quite minimal. But really? reaching out to a lot, yeah, which is so interesting to me, and I. I oftentimes be like, let's organize a hunt, let's do this and get no responses. So, really? yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, a lot of them do go with their partners. Mm, um, yeah. I, I, I very rarely find a, a solo woman trying to get into it, which I think there would possibly be quite a large audience for, but there is that fear and that lack of understanding to get involved. And I think yeah. this is where. I'm trying to change that a bit. and I, I want people to have enough confidence just to do it. There, there's a lot of issues around safety. I mean, you know, especially when you're fishing, you know, you have to look at different tides and times and oftentimes you need to fish at, in, at dark, you know, where the tides are high early yeah. in the morning, late at night. And as a woman, you just can't do that by yourself. Yeah. Um, so I often have to reach out to my followers and be like, hey, like, someone please can you come with me you know i can't i want to do this i just can't do it by myself at this time um silly me had to put my trust in a lot of people i didn't know which is also silly (laughs) but it's worked out (laughs) no like seriously silly i mean there was this one person that i reached out to he had a a youtube channel which he's trying to grow and he's a little little bit younger than me and he seemed like a really decent guy um, and I reached out to him. I said, look, I really want to go hunting in the South Island um, to, to get my first deer on the bow. At that point, I think I was hunting, well, I've been hunting once at that point, which was a bit, you know, quite ambitious of me to then go target a big red deer stat. <laughs> and um, uh, he was like, yep, no worries. He goes hunting in the mountains there. And I booked my flight. Went to go visit him. I had my tent. He had his. And for five days, I think, no, I think uh, maybe three or four days, we went hiking <laughs> and hunting. And I, you know, now made a lifelong friend. And I've done the same with multiple fishing experiences. And I think there's a lot of people that are so willing to have that helping hand and reach out. And now that I'm like a voice for the females to do that as well. And now I'm getting, you know, people reaching out and I'm taking people are fishing and hunting and things like that which is everything what i wanted to do you know that is awesome people more involved yeah yeah so do you see that turning into a career opportunity for you like is that something that you would ever do as an occupation 100 percent, 100 percent. um you know fishing and hunting is is quite an expense <laughs> to get involved in i mean a single yeah. boat, like you look at over a thousand five hundred or two thousand dollars flying around the country and investing in reels and rods so i would definitely need to make like a good amount from it <laughs> to yeah. leave my job now um but it, it would definitely be a life life term goal for me absolutely yeah that is awesome well, yeah. I hope that that happens for you because it, I can definitely see the passion. I mean, to know that you've only been doing it for five months and you just have this passion flowing from you is insane. Like, I could have sworn <laughs> yeah. you've been doing it for so much longer. Really? Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's good. I definitely haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so I how have you managed to be so successful? I know that you have talked about, you know, talking to other groups and having other people take you. Is that a lot of what's fed into you being able to, you know, I mean, you you caught a freaking huge bluefin tuna. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a crazy thing on its own. So what do you think has been the biggest thing that has led you to be successful when you're out there hunting and fishing? I would say 100% the people that I've met and YouTube. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, awesome. YouTube is such, like, just like, just like you, Joe, when you're saying you learn fly fishing from YouTube, like, it's honestly the most incredible resource to use. Um, But what I did find was it was quite overwhelming because a lot of people have their own opinions when it comes to how to rig a line or how to hunt with a bow. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I had to rely on a few people that I met along the way. And that was just my, the, the people that started following me who were passionate about hunting and fishing. So I would go along, I would be with them. And I think everything in life happens for a reason. I'm quite, I would say spiritual in that sense. Um, and I, I, this person came into my life and she's has no online presence, very under the radar, lovely, lovely woman. And she's actually the top bow hunter in the whole of New Zealand, three years in a row. Really? Yeah. Wow. Like she is, she's, that is insane. yeah, she's killed over 800 goat with a bow. She started bow hunting, I think, you know, younger than 12 years old. She is amazing. Um, like three tar in one day, which is unheard of with a bow. Um, That's crazy. So she came into my life and she was like my mentor, taught me how to bow hunt was there with me on my first, second, and third hunt ever, tr- you know, teaching me how to gut and, you know, everything when it, when it came to hunting. So she was a blessing in my life, really, for hunting. Um, so That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. I can't show her in any, any of my videos because she really doesn't want to be online, and that's what I think I love about her even more, you know? <laughs> Super under the radar, <laughs> but just a beast on a bow. Um, so yeah, she's really that helpful. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's different. So have you started making your own ways? So like you said that everybody does things differently. Do yeah. you have your ways that you have pretty much, you know, figured out that works the best for you? Honestly, not yet. Um, and I, I think currently right now being such a beginner, I'm in the stage where I'm just trying out everything. I'm testing out everything you know so someone tells me to do one thing i'll try it out another person tells me to do another thing I'll, I'll give it a go and i think the more i do that i'll start forming my own way and see what's working best um and i think yeah. i think i give myself another like at least six months until i get to that mm-hmm. point you know um for sure because right right now i'm just asking so many questions i'm not forming my own ways just yet Yeah. Mm. I'm sure that's only a matter of time because I mean, hell, I've been fly fishing consecutively, like really heavy into it for I guess about five years now. And I still find myself asking questions and I'll be out there experiencing something. I'm like, well, I need to go check YouTube or check Google <laughs> and see if I can figure this out. Why is yeah. this happening and stuff like that? Yeah. So. But that's, that's, that's also the thing I think is so, all, I mean, I guess it's really applicable to anything, but especially like with the outdoors. I mean, you, there's so much to learn. Like, there was a um, a fly fishing, I guess, for lack of a better term, convention, uh, mm. an event, we'll just call it, out in College Station last year. And it was really, really cool. And they invited a bunch of, like, fly casting instructors and mm. guides and things like that to do seminars, talks, and all that. And then the day after, it was kind of a gathering of some of the best fly casters, like, in the state and other parts of the, st- in other parts of the country, too. And everyone was just there, like exchanging knowledge and like giving tips. And these people who are pretty well known, I guess, in the uh, fishing industry here in Texas and in other parts of the country, like they're still like students. They're still asking questions. Mm-hmm. They're still really like observant. They're still trying to learn and pick up things. And mm-hmm. I mean, it was pretty incredible what like the exchange of knowledge that was occurring, even amongst professionals. You know, wow. it's, it's one, yeah. of the, one of the pre- and I think it's one of the coolest things about the outdoor. Um, industry in particular um, mm-hmm. at, at least in, in the groups that I've been fortunate enough to like um, I guess be involved in everyone's very receptive everyone's very welcoming and everyone's willing to learn mm-hmm. or sorry willing to teach if people are willing to learn I think yeah. that's what's really really cool about this whole thing 100% I feel like people share everything but their secret spots on where the good fish are <laughs> <laughs> that is fair yeah <laughs> It's definitely understandable. They want to save the resource for themselves. <laughs> exactly. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, oh, if I can get my hands on some of those people's fish finders where they log in <laughs> all the, <laughs> I would be the happiest girl. <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, I've, I've learned now, you know, I've been quite fortunate enough as well that some people have taken me to their very special spots, which, you know, I've taken them years to find. Um mm-hmm. Which, and it does take years, you know, I, I think that's also the beauty of, 
of fishing and hunting, it just brings you back to the traditional olden day life where, you know, nowadays everything is about quick validation or quick, just getting quick hit mm-hmm. with dopamine where fishing and hunting is not like that. It is patience. It has tested me. I have cried multiple times on hunts, multiple times on, on my <laughs> fishes, you know, which people often walk past while I'm fishing on a rock and see me just absolutely so frustrated because nothing's working out. <laughs> um, and it's it's taught me a lot. It, it definitely hasn't been easy. Like I'll put it very mm. bluntly. It's been very, very, very difficult learning by myself. And I think that's why a lot of people don't do it. Um, but it has been the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life ever. I'm so grateful. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you don't mind me asking, um, mm-hmm. in your opinion, what do you think the most challenging part about learning this on your own has been? Oh, that is a loaded question as well. Um, I think the most challenging is just not knowing, you know, like, mm-hmm. Especially when it comes, because there's fishing, but then you've got fly fishing, you've got deep sea fishing, you've got boat fishing, land-based fishing. You can't learn all of that in a month or two months or three. It takes people years from experience. And also I found Mm -hmm. a massive difference between learning on YouTube and reading or listening to people to actually doing it yourself. The amount of times that I forgot how to tie a bloody... If it's what's the name? If G knot, <laughs> you know, or just forget forgot all these main knots that I, I've tried over and over again. I've I've forgotten so many times. Um, so I think it's just that it, the, what's been hard is just the lack of patience that I've had, um, which I'm still learning. I'm still learning, and you learn so much about yourself as well because it is challenging times that test you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've been land-based fishing now for five months and often going, you know, off the rocks to some pretty dangerous places by myself, <laughs> losing rods, reels, bait, everything. And, um, spending like seven hours there throughout the whole day and walking home with nothing. And that's, has happened so many times. And that's, I think that's one of the most challenging as well. So you mentioned that when you hunt, you hunt to eat. Do you fish for the same reason or do you fish for enjoyment? Oh, I don't think I'm not. A lot of people are not going to like this, but I fish for enjoyment. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I I actually never liked fish uh, and, I, and I'm still trying to get used to eating fish. I now uh, really like it. It's, it's it's taken a while for me to have that switch. I'm now making fish curries and smoking fish and all of that. Um, but I would say I definitely oftentimes will go out fish, catch and release and not always take hmm. home what I catch. Yeah. I, I genuinely do it out of enjoyment. I see. Yeah. Us as fly fishermen, we uh typically catch and release majority of the time anyways. So. Yeah. 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 So did you, cause I mean, just from, I guess what we've discussed so far, it seems like you really enjoy cooking. You really enjoy yeah. making use of the meat that you, that you uh, harvest. Did you like cooking before um, yes. getting into the outdoors too? Or do you, do you think like that experience as well has shifted because of your engagement in the outdoors? Good question. I actually, my background um, is, so as you know, I was vegan in a meat eating country. I mean, we had, do you know what biltong is? It's like jerky. I do not. It's like jerky, but it's a South African style jerky. I would have jerky for breakfast, lunch, dinner, steaks for snacks. Like I I was a meat eating fanatic. And I came across one YouTube video, I think when I was like 16 or something. And it, it was when vegan was becoming the thing and it's the healthy thing to do. So I became vegan overnight. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, <laughs> and I was stay vegan for three years. And I was, oh my gosh, how do I learn how to cook? I don't know how to eat vegetables. Like I make them nice and yum. So that was my, <laughs> that was my journey of, of learning how to cook. Um, and then I went on to writing my own recipe book for, ve- you know, for plant-based food. And then wow. I became very sick. I was traveling Asia vegan as well and just not getting enough protein. My hair was falling out. I had like cystic acne. My hormones were messed up. 
And out of from three years, in, after three years, all of a sudden, I just had this intense craving for like a bloody raw steak. And I was like to myself, okay, it's time. It's time. I need, I need. <laughs> <laughs> and I flew back to South Africa, had a steak, and I was the first time I felt human after three years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that is crazy. Crazy. Hey, and my, even my hairdresser said, oh, my gosh, you've got so much new hair growing. Like, what have you done? And I was like, oh, I'm no longer vegan. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. So I think a lot of that cooking has come from that experience. Um, and now I'm thinking even doing a recipe for catch and cook for, you know, and mm-hmm. teach people nice. what to do with like a, with when you, when you kill a goat, you know, how do you kill that and how to do a roast goat leg or, um, a stunning, you know, I don't know, kingfish curry. Um, so it does get quite a bit of engagement and I see people don't really know what to do when they catch a fish and how to cook it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, there's definitely an audience for that. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's something that me and Jose have talked about in the past because him and I both enjoy cooking and we both enjoy fishing and hunting. So yeah. we've contemplated like creating this. We, we've thought about creating a cookbook where basically regionally, wherever you're at, you can try to forage as well as hunt. And so we want to use everything that you can find there. That way you can field dress it and cook it with what's around you. So that's that kind of an idea that him and I have that. We haven't even started yet, but that's something that we think there's an audience for as well. <laughs> that is so cool. So cool. Because you can't really find that online, like especially where right. you are. And so there's a map. I'm sure there'll be a market for that for sure. Definitely. Yeah, Can you do one for New Zealand? But it's hard because you'll have to, right? Yeah, exactly. You'll have to find an area to do Like you can't make one cookbook with all these different areas because then it's no. not really going to make sense. And, no. and, you know, not everybody's going to buy something, but. True. Yeah, that's one thing we'd have to try to figure out how to do it in a region, but then we'd have to go and actually research. Like we'd have True. to find out what's there and, and get boots on the ground and actually go hunt there. And so I mean, that's more of a reason for us to use it as a write-off. But <laughs> <laughs> exactly. True. You can do like a whole documentary series of you creating this book and you actually oh, go nice, out yeah. and hunt and you know make to do it a whole video thing as well, series out of that. that so that's a, yeah. that's something I would totally watch because I love cooking. I want to see what you guys do, you know, especially local per area. Brilliant idea. Exactly. Brilliant. Mm. So there's something that you actually might enjoy. Um, have you ever heard of the company Huckberry or the person Brad Leone? Huckberry rings. No, I, no, I have, I've never. No. Okay. So I'll send you some links whenever we get off here. Mm-hmm. And there is a series called Making It. Uh, by Brad Leone on his YouTube channel. And he does that essentially. He'll make a video of going somewhere, um, whether it be to, I think, Illinois pheasant hunting or going out to Chesapeake Bay and catching crabs. But he'll go to these areas and he'll harvest whatever animal is there and forage from whatever's there and make a meal there. And he's just so energetic and he's just very entertaining to watch as it is. Yeah. Um, but he goes and he makes these meals in these locations using what's found there. And so I think you'd really get a kick out of that. So I'll send you some links. Cool. Please off. do. So he has, a, he has a YouTube thing? Yes. Okay. He has a YouTube and he's pretty active on Instagram as well. Oh, God. Send them through, please. <laughs> I will for sure. Yeah. And there's another one. Uh, have you heard of Yeti Coolers? Yes, I have. Okay. Okay. So they uh, they have a YouTube channel. They got some actually really, really sick videos, but. There was a series called My Hungry Life, and there's a um, a chef. His name is Eduardo Garcia. Uh, he kind of like similar concept to what Russell was discussing with the other guy. He he goes. It's like a little mini series. He goes to different places. He hunts and he fishes, and then he also forages, and he kind of tries to get involved with the locals and things, and and mm-hmm. uh, just creates like these really amazing meals. And it's got a really cool story being told too. That's a, and it's not. It, it's an easy watch because you're like. I don't know, like five to 10 minute long videos. Uh, yeah. So you can knock them out pretty quick. But they're, I mean, mm-hmm. those videos are really, really cool too. I really oh, enjoy those. 100% watch that. Because um, do they go back into their kitchen and cook it? Or is it like in nature, they'll make a fire or do it all there outside? So for the My Hungry Life ones, he does it. I mean, kind of what he has available to him, really. So in one episode, uh, they did have a grill and some things, so they did it there. Um, I think there was another one where they did it kind of in the backcountry. 
Um, and I can't remember if he used like a little camp stove or I think he actually just did it over an open flame on that one. But uh, yeah, so it just kind of varies too with, with his. I don't know about that. Uh, so cool. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty neat. Yeah, with Brad Leone, he does a little bit of a mixture of both. Like the one he did in Chesapeake Bay with the crabs, he was on the dock making the crabs. Oh, wow. Um, he actually made some uh, soft shell crab sandwiches, which looked phenomenal. Oh. I've never had one, but Yum. they eat like the whole crab. Oh, so <laughs> um, but some of them he takes back to the kitchen as well and has a whole setup. It's almost like a cooking show setup where you have the camera above and whatnot. So. There's something about cooking shows that you can just watch for hours. Like I, I just, I just always play those shows in the background mm -hmm. and then you get hungry. <laughs> um, but I yeah. just recently bought a four by four, which is really exciting because I, that's the lifestyle I want to live. I want to chuck the rod, rods in the back, take my four by four, drive on the beach. And I want to cook my dinner on an open flame mm -hmm. with the fish that mm -hmm. I just caught. Like that is a life I envision. And then go four by fouring on the sand dunes and just have fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've, um, I've got a rooftop tent as well. So you just chuck that open, spend the night there, watch the sunrise. Isn't that just life, right? So much yes, better than that. Sounds like the life to live. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And in New Zealand, you absolutely can do that because it's so safe. There's there's no animal that's gonna be roaming around trying to kill you, like South Africa. <laughs> there's <no laughs> grizzly bears where you guys are, but um, oh, a grizzly bear would actually be so cool to get on a bow. I mean that that fur and that that skin would be incredible, and the meat apparently is mm -hmm. not too bad. Yeah, I'm actually going on my first bear hunt in three weeks, oh. I think three three and a half weeks. Um, it's for black bear. I've never been on a bear hunt of any sort, um, but I'm excited for that. But I don't know if I would have like <laughs> the skill to hunt a grizzly bear with a bow. Really? I feel like that is insane. Yeah, <laughs> I mean. I've, I've, maybe it's just all the stories and, and videos that I've seen of things that could go wrong, oh. but ooh, that's grizzly bears are just far more aggressive than that of a black bear. Mm, I've heard, yeah. I've heard. I know some black bears are pretty large, aren't they? Like they're pretty. Huge. Uh, they're about half the size, to even the quarter mm -hmm. of the size of some of the brown bears out there. They're okay. pretty small. Okay. Yeah, but, well, small relative to, to a black bear, they can still get pretty big. I think. Uh, in South Carolina or North Carolina, I think the state record was like somewhere around 800 pounds or something like that. Oh, wow. What? 700 pounds. It's, I mean, yeah, they're, it was a big bear. So they get, they do get big in some parts, but they are going to be smaller than the grizzly bears and brown bears. Insane. For sure, 100%. Here in Arkansas, I think their average, like 300 pounds, is, is a good sized bear here in Arkansas. So that's, so that's still pretty small compared to like 1,200 pound. Grizzly yeah. bears and yeah. up in Alaska. So <laughs> <laughs> I know actually a few bow hunters that travel to Alaska every year to target them and like I think they're really? called are they snow leopards or something? I don't know. Some some pretty cool stuff. Um and I mean they, they've killed like really big ones. Um and I I just don't <laughs> know how they like how would you carry it back? You kinda need like a helicopter or something to lift it <laughs> yeah. up and put it somewhere. Like how do you you know, it's crazy huge those sides and so dangerous um i've seen so many yeah. movies and like documentaries on bear kills and oh my gosh but love a challenge so <laughs> i'll work yeah. my yeah. way up <laughs> yeah definitely definitely a challenge. yeah yeah you guys yeah, i think i would want to work my way up to that for sure i, I think yeah. i'll start with the black bear and then i'll see i do want to get a moose with a bow and i do want to get a caribou and I would like to get an elk. So <gasps> I could probably work my way up. And maybe by the time I got all those knocked off, I might have the nuts to actually go for a grizzly bear. <laughs> but that's still debatable. <laughs> what, is a, what is a caribou? A uh, reindeer. So ah. it's, it's reindeer is like a domesticated caribou. But it has similar antlers to like a fallow deer. Kind oh, of wow. almost. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a very uh, just pretty beige, gray, and white deer like animal oh man okay okay but quite large uh yeah they're well they're not as big as like like a red deer they're smaller than a red deer i'd say they're probably similar to the size of um are you familiar with like mule deer yes 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 okay yeah. so they're probably they're probably i'd say about the size of a mule deer a little bit bigger than a white tail mm, okay nice yeah because an elk smaller is, than an elk yeah elks are huge eh? oh my gosh yeah. an elk would be incredible incredible 
That's like I think yeah, the that's, peak that's of definitely there. a pinnacle for me. Yeah. That and a moose. Like oh, oh. the moose are so freaking huge. Oh man. And and like I wonder how they taste as well differently to Oh, so good. Moose so I'm from Alaska originally. Oh um, yeah. and I've actually never never been moose hunting, but um I'm Native American and I've actually been sent moose meat and then my family up there, I think the last time I was up there, they made a fresh moose and rhubarb stew oh, that was so good. Gosh. And it was fresh rhubarb, too, harvested out there. No and way. moose meat is so good, yeah. Okay, that's what you need to do, your first recipe book. <laughs> right? I need to go back to my roots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool that you're Native American and that you get sent that raw meat. That's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't got it in quite a few years, but I used to get uh, salmon yearly and, and sometimes moose and stuff and uh oh man yeah it was it was so good oh. it's like smoked salmon so you talked about smoking fish smoked yeah. salmon is probably some of the best fish that i've ever had in my life um oh you're so lucky because salmon farms i just don't trust at all um just mm-hmm. seeing the documentaries on how dirty and, and really gross that can get but raw fresh salmon that you can harvest at the back of your you know back of your house and the country land like that really has to be the pinnacle um and it's beautiful like that red color so nutrient rich as well um but yeah smoking that would be incredible or more i can imagine (laughs) it's like the best fish you can buy so good yeah and and the fish they would send me it was smoked with birch wood which i've never had anything with birch other than that before and it is just this completely different flavor because i mean i grew up in texas and so there you, you need to eat a lot of smoked meats, but it's typically yeah. with mesquite or with oak. Yeah. Um, so I'd never had any type of like birch smoked anything, but it's a whole different flavor profile. But yeah, it's so oh. good. And yeah, Man. smoking it changes everything, eh? Oh yeah, it does. My my buddy, so my old roommate. Uh, this was this would have been like 2015, 16. Mm-hmm. But he made what he called candied salmon, and so he brined it with uh sugar but i think it was brown sugar garlic and some other stuff some other spices i can't recall mm. but he smoked it for a couple of hours oh my god it was one of the best pieces of fish i've ever had in my life it was so good incredible <laughs> yeah, i gotta ask him for the recipe yes please and share it with everyone <laughs> <laughs> i um i recently actually smoked the bluefin tuna which is something you don't really do um because it's so good raw but i just had so much of it and the good thing about smoking it just lasts for months in the fridge um yeah. and i quite like mine smoked like over smoked so it gets a little bit tougher and less like, moist and it's almost mm-hmm. like this like not jerky style, but almost like a little bit more leathery, I guess. And there's a chew to it. It's and it was it tastes like caramelized in a way, but that brown sugar is so necessary. You need that. Yeah. There's a you guys probably know him. It's Outdoor Boys on YouTube. I don't think I've heard of him. I think I know who you're talking about. He's the he wears glasses, kind of skinny yeah, blonde guy. Yeah, the, the yeah, old yeah. guys with the, the, the with the boys, the three kids. Yeah. <laughs> Such a he actually lives in alaska doesn't he yeah he does yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and he actually um he well went through his what his youtube channel he gave me the idea to extra smoke the fish for a little bit longer and because he makes it quite tough the fish and it's so good like you've actually got to try it hmm. i love the true to it yeah yeah good. yeah yeah, so it's actually like his videos is, is a prime example of how I learned as well, you know, just to have the guts and like you can do it by yourself. doesn't matter if you, yeah. anyone really, you can, you, he doesn't look like a typical, you know, he's an he, accountant, he I think, or lawyer looks, or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's really is for everyone. You don't have to grow up fishing or grow up hunting or grow up in the nature. You just, anyone can do it. You just have to learn. So like things like that gave me a bit of um, confidence just to just to do it. Yeah, Keith's yeah. has amazing videos, amazing videos. Yeah, I love his videos, and he does some crazy stuff. Like he's out there kayaking on a like b- between icebergs and a glacier to get to a <laughs> yeah. certain spot, and he'll go out there and camp for three days, <laughs> yeah. like in the middle of absolutely nowhere, kayaking you know twenty miles to get there. It's nuts. <laughs> freezing outside and yeah. so crazy i don't know how you guys can manage i mean texas is of course so different in temperature i don't know how you can manage living in such cold climates oh it's terrible yeah. i last time i was there in the winter time it got to negative 68 degrees fahrenheit 
And Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. We've gone swimming when it's like negative 40 degrees no, Fahrenheit at the no. hot springs and your hair, like you get out of the water and your hair freezes instantly. No, It's insane. That's yeah. so cool. <laughs> it, it's, it's an awesome experience, but I don't know if I could ever live there again. No. I mean, I live in Arkansas now, but the day that we moved away from Alaska, we moved from Alaska to Arizona, which it was 101 degree difference the day that we moved. Cause it was like negative 40 in Alaska and positive 70 in Arizona. And that was like in the wintertime, you know, so Arizona gets much hotter than that. Yeah. 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 I'm the kind of person that like, for like loves the extra, extra, extra heat. Like I used to live in an Abu Dhabi. (laughs) Everyone says that. (laughs) Do you know where Abu Dhabi is? Like next to Dubai. Yeah. I mean, temperatures there would get to, we, we use Celsius. So it would, it would get up to like 50 degrees above Celsius. Um, don't know how much that is in Fahrenheit, but really hot. So I'm used yeah. to those kind of temperatures. Whereas New Zealand, like a 20 degrees winter is so cold for me, <laughs> um, which New Zealanders think it's actually really warm. But yeah, climatizing mm-hmm. takes quite a bit, quite a long time, especially when you're camping in those climates in the snow yeah, like absolutely yeah, yeah yeah so i looked it up 50 degrees celsius is 122 degrees fahrenheit that is insane <laughs> <laughs> yeah Not for me. is it pretty dry there in abu dhabi yeah 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 but we, we would go camping okay. in the deserts you know yeah i mean yeah so dry wow. it's a little different arizona's you know yeah. we yeah. would see 115 120 with no no humidity which is far different than that of humidity, but at the same time, it True. dries out your skin and it dries just, out. Uh, yeah, I'm not a desert person. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I love the mountains too much. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a different life, hey. I mean, my first animal I ever rode was a camel. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, <laughs> I was young and living in Abu Dhabi. We would go camping in the sand dunes and deserts, and there was there was there would always be beautiful oceans right next to the desert with the most mm-hmm. amazing fishing as well. Um, and people there, obviously it's quite traditional for that, for the cultures there to fast and do really long fasting. Um, mm-hmm. and people would like also water fast and during 50 degrees Celsius heat, a lot of people would actually die. Like, yeah, you know, wow. all because they're just fasting f- for their religion and everything. So it's quite a very, very intense country with very intense, um, climates, but I've been eyeing out Australia, I'm not going to lie, and uh, it's looking very warm and lovely right now. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm, but I don't everything know, I might, can kill you there. Literally. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> very much so. But the species there are so different when it comes to fishing, and I've, I would love yeah. to get a, a kangaroo on a bow too. That would be awesome. I actually yeah. recently tried kangaroo jerky. It's so good. Really? I've heard. Yeah. Uh, why do you guys have kangaroo up there? Is it just imported? We we don't. It's imp- it's imported meat. <laughs> yeah. Nice. 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 But, yeah. It's uh. It's I, I actually talked about it recently on a podcast, and and Jose said he'd tried it before. And yeah. there's a, a beef jerky shop here downtown that in the town that I live in. And um, every time I've gone in there, I've seen that they carry kangaroo jerky, but they've never had it. And so we were down there last week, and I walked in. I said. They have it. So I bought it, and it is really good. And along with it, I bought a uh, ostrich meat stick oh. that was actually surprisingly good. I've never had ostrich before, and it, it's pretty good. How good is ostrich? Hmm. Ostrich is um, a very commonly eaten bird in South Africa. Really? Yeah, ostrich jerky. We just eat it all That's the time. So good. Yeah, it's good, eh? Hmm. <laughs> it is, and it, I would have never guessed that it was a bird. It doesn't taste birdie i know like, it tastes like it's like a dark red meat yeah because it is a dark red eh? if i'm remembering it's it's dark um whereas really? yeah whereas crocodile is actually very chicken tasting like <laughs> <laughs> i've never had crocodile but i've had alligator and i would assume uh, it would be yeah. very similar i think so yeah 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 so good actually one of my favorite meats oh really mm-hmm. yeah now, alligator tail fried with a uh, nice like Spicy marinara sauce. Oh, Interesting. Or cocktail sauce. Yeah. So good. And what do you just remove the scales? Like it's quite. They, aren't they quite tough? I've actually never harvested one. Harvested one myself, but okay. um, in Cajun cuisine, they eat a lot of a lot of alligator, and so mm-hmm. um, Cajun food is one of my favorite things to eat. And so I've had alligator recreationally, um, or you know, out at a restaurant. I've never yeah. had it myself. Yeah. I, I, that is a goal of mine is to actually harvest one and, and eat it that way. But yep. I've only had it out at restaurants. 
See, that that would be pretty cool. I mean, I don't know. I don't think a bow might be strong enough. Dep- well, just, I guess it's dependent mm-hmm. on poundage. Most people that kill them have to use... Um, so typically what they'll do is they'll rope them and then shoot them. There's a there's about a quarter size spot on top of their head that's soft enough that a bullet can go through. Mm-hmm. And so they'll use a rifle and actually shoot it to kill it. Oh, you've got to have good accuracy. <laughs> yeah. But that's you might be able to use the, the, an arrow to... Um... Like anchor it, like reel it in, and then use the the gun. Or I think I think there also there's something called a uh, a boomstick or a bang stick, which essentially like mm-hmm. it's like a rifle or handgun cartridge screwed into the tip, and then you just kind of push down, and that that when you push down, mm-hmm. it hits the primer, and that sets it off. But people use that to dispatch them too. So I I, I want to say I've I've seen where people will use like crossbows or compounds, whatever, kind of like yeah. bow fishing. They use something like that. And it gets through the hide, and they kind of reel in the alligator to where you can then dispatch it. I could be wrong, Ooh. but I feel like that's a that, thing. Yeah. I don't know. That would be really hard to reel in, I can imagine, with a bow, eh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I've actually uh, felt the weight of an alligator on a fly rod before. Oh, I was down Lord. in South Louisiana, and uh, it was probably about a five and a half foot long alligator that bit a popper. And I felt it briefly. And uh, <laughs> no. it, it was a blast. It was an absolute blast. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is this is why one of my biggest target animals would be a shark. I would oh, love same. to reel in a shark. Hey, in Florida, oh my gosh, you guys have got big yeah. shark there. Hey? Um, I, I want to catch a, a bull shark, a hammerhead shark, a mako shark, or a spinner shark. A but I feel like a cold. spinner shark would be so fun. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're the ones with quite a long tail, hey? And they're kind of... Uh, That's a th- thresher shark. Oh, a thresher shark. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Spinner thresher shark. sharks have a really long tail. Spinner, spinner sharks, they, they'll jump like 15 feet, 20 feet out of the water and just spin. Oh, it's that's insane to watch. Oh, so cool. Imagine that on a drone. <laughs> right? <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah, and yeah. spinner sharks will actually hit like lures and stuff too. Oh, that's so interesting. There's a, a dude on YouTube. He was throwing a popper, and spinner sharks are actually going for his popper. It was insane. That oh man, that would be so cool. I think um, this summer I would definitely be targeting sharks because I mean we we're getting so many at the moment. It's almost like a pest. Um, and oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's like really quite quite large sharks as well, just on the coast. My first time I ever went spear fishing. Here's a story for you. So <laughs> I went with a commercial diver he has been diving his whole life okay and every single day it's his job never came a shark in his uh, never bumped into a shark in his life the <laughs> one day my first day i ever go spear fishing i go with him and he's like kyla been doing this for years and you, don't worry you'll be fine and then i jump into the water i'm learning how to equalize and i've got my spear gun like i'm ready and after an hour i get the confidence to to swim off without him into the deep okay like pitch black water (laughs) and there were few divers in the area i knew with like tanks and everything i was just free diving and i see this massive shadow just like quickly in front of me and i'm like oh it must be a diver whatever all of a sudden and this is the thing about diving you just don't know what's around you within two seconds there was this two meter mako shark which are like quite quite large sharks yeah like charging me like this thing is like the tails up like it is going it's gunning for me and then then it kind of figures out who i am because i put my spear gun in front of it i'm like just dangling in front of it and it like turns instantly and it actually follows me for about 45 minutes in the water um apparently yeah it's crazy and never ever do this obviously but the first thing i do is i I turn around and I swim as fast as I can. I'm the water's (laughs) going everywhere. Like I jump on my friend. Um, and he didn't believe me, but until he saw it, I mean, he, yeah, we just took our fish and and we got straight out of there, but the sharks are getting pretty clever. The moment they see a diver, they know food, um, is coming. Mm. So they just, they tag along with you and you just never know, like their, their aggression can switch on the moment you, you get onto a fish. Um, then yeah. I can mistake your arm for like something, you know. So that was my first experience spear fishing. <laughs> that Man, that's insane. quite the experience. Oh my yeah. word! I got charged by a shark one time. I was actually fishing in Florida, 
And uh, so I was over there. I used to play football and we had playoffs down there in Florida. And so we ended up losing that game. And the next morning I said, I'm going to go fishing. Yeah. So I went out to the beach and I went to a fly shop the day before and kind of got some intel on where to go and what to target. And um, so I was like, all right, well, I'm, I'm gung ho. And he told me this spot and he said, go, because there's two sandbars. He said, go to the, the second sandbar and cast out as far as you can. It's going to get more towards the turquoise water. He said, and there's striper running through there. Um, there's redfish running through there. There's tarpon running through there and there's snook running through there and all sorts of stuff. I was like, Oh yeah, definitely. So I go out there and the water was choppy that day. It was extremely windy. And so the water was about chest high, but the waves were breaking over my head. Mm -hmm. And so I'm having to time it between waves and like kind of jump because I'm fly fishing to try to time my cast and get it out there. And after about, you know, 30, 45 minutes, I see this shadow off to the right, about 45 degrees, about, you know, 40 feet out. And, I see the shadow and I'm thinking, oh, that's a tarpon. So I start casting at it and these waves keep coming and my feet are coming off the ground and kind of dangling as I'm coming up. Mm. And uh, I see it turn towards me and I'm getting excited because I think I'm going to catch this fish. (laughs) And then I realize it's a shark and it just straight towards me. I mean, I've never seen something turn on like that. I mean, it just came straight at me and I'm hitting it with my fly rod and I hit it a couple of times and it kind of swims off and scurries off. (gasps) And I was terrified. I was like 200 yards from the beach too. And so I turn around and I get out of that water and I was shaking. I was terrified, (laughs) but it was about, about six feet close to two meters as well. That's insane. But I've got two questions here. The fact that you were like, like literally bashing it and it still kept like i I don't know how you had the balls for that (laughs) and then secondly fly fishing in ocean water is that a thing it's amazing wait it it is a thing it's it's a growing thing no Uh, it's yeah it it is very exciting i've actually caught a 54 inch redfish on the fly rod in no way with what kind of flies uh little crab it looks like a little crab no way yeah Fly fishing in the salt water is a thing, and it is absolutely amazing. And you obviously have to use bigger hooks for that, eh? Uh, not not all the time. Uh, there's actually a lot of people that'll fish for bonefish and stuff like that, and they're using pretty small hooks. That is like so even for tarpon, like some of the hooks are actually pretty small for those guys too. Yeah. Weird. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Okay. Yeah, it, it is a thing that's growing. Um, actually, if I'm not mistaken, there is a uh, a kind of sandworm or something that hatches certain times of year in florida and they will use these tiny little hooks with tiny little worm-like flies and catch these massive tarpon on them no there's like a week or two week long season no ways Mm -hmm. the fact that it is only like two weeks long makes it even more enjoyable because you know that like you know and it's just exciting when something's so like not as available and you just want to target that that's so cool i i don't think i've ever met someone that's done that before and i definitely it has not hit new zealand from what i know <laughs> but i've only really well, been in this get yourself on a fly rod and start it <laughs> i think i will yeah i think i will i'm i am a hundred percent gonna gonna investigate fly fishing for sure, you I definitely think it's should. Time. And if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'll Thank any way you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I probably will. I definitely have, will have a lot of questions. Um, I think that's also the beauty about learning, right? Like the only thing you can get good at something is you just ask heaps of questions. Um, so yeah, I yeah, questions coming your way. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> well, we're here you. for it. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yeah, especially because you course. guys seem so passionate about it. You know. Oh, we are for sure. Mm. We love it. I mean, the sport in its own is just amazing to me. I can't speak for Jose, but I'm pretty sure he feels very similarly. But just the sport in its own is amazing. And it, and like we were talking about earlier, it's just so intimate. But on top of mm-hmm. that, I feel like the community of fly fishing cares a little bit more about the conservation of the animals uh, because it's more in- intimate. We just care more about the healthier water and, and saving the fish and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how it is in New Zealand, but there are some people here that um, have this different like trash fish mentality to where if it's not the, the species they're going for, they don't care about any of the other yeah. ones and they just want to, you know, cull them. Hundred um, percent. But us, I mean, yeah. I love fishing for the strangest things, the toothy critters and and the lazy fish. Like yeah. that, that's kind of my thing. But I care about them all, and I want to protect them all. Yeah. Of course, you know it's different when if there's an invasive species that's you know affecting an area. Of course, I'll do what I can to help yes. the indigenous animals. But um, it just seems like the fly fishing community cares a little bit more about yeah. the animal in the water. So I love um, that. That's something that you might realize. Yeah, I love that. And it, I, I would say it's almost quite similar for the bow hunting community as well. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah, because 
it was a rifle, you know, you can be hundreds of yards away and, and get something, you know, without the deer even knowing. With a bow, it's, there's, honestly, I think there's like one out of 10 chance that you actually end up killing the animal compared to a gun. Um, mm-hmm. So there's just so much more patience and respect required, you know. And it's what's really unfortunate yeah. is that Australia recently has banned bow hunting in, I think it's um, Southern Australia, if I'm correct. I'll have to double check that. Um, I think it's it's to do with the ethics around bow hunting because there is more of a chance that you won't get a kill shot. But in yeah. saying that, like, it's just so much harder to get that shot than a gun anyway. So people are just really not happy about that um yeah. which is so unfortunate you know yeah yeah it seems um, like the bow hunters here eat breathe and sleep bow hunting i'm not yeah. sure about there but it seems like the bow hunters here like they'll go out there when it's not season and they're out there practicing and, their <laughs> yeah. bows and making sure that they are ready to take that shot so it's interesting so to me to see both ways because in my experience the bow hunters you know seem to want to always get that kill shot um mm-hmm. but yeah. then again i've also met people that just kind of want to get out there and do it they don't practice they don't prepare themselves and i can see how there would be a lot of shots taken that oh. probably aren't shots. oh yes and i i think for me learning as well like i think a big step for bow hunting and what i would tell people getting into it which i'm i'm doing these messages daily people ask a lot of women actually which is amazing really yeah a lot of older women are, are messaging me you know saying look i really want to get into this how do i get into it you know women that don't even look like hunters at all which is so awesome um and i say look first things first you've got to get a bow suited to you you can't just Mm -hmm. pick up my bow and give it a go and which is i i never knew that it's so different got to get it suited for you the the the, the peep the the draw length the poundage everything and the arrows as well um and then you've got to go visit a club like an archery club and then start training on on targets you've got to get hitting Mm -hmm. those targets and i did that for about at least like a month um until i actually Mm -hmm. did my first hunt but i mean i'm talking like every day i got my own target bag my my saying was five arrows a day and you always end up doing more because it's so fun right (laughs) um (laughs) and then i then i then i actually got a range finder and wow that made a difference because i didn't own one before which was good because you can learn sort of um estimates and yeah. uh, the range finder was a massive help. And then, yeah, so I, I, practice is so important to get that kill shot. Um, mm, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my first hunt ever, there was a goat directly in front of me. And this is so embarrassing. It was 10 yards away. Okay. <laughs> 10 <laughs> yards. Looked directly in front of me. And this is my first ever, ever, ever time hunting um, with a bow, at least. And I, I drew back ready to kill the shot and i didn't even see in front of me that there was a branch on my bow which was messing with my uh i don't know what the name is with the uh yeah thank you (laughs) um messing with my cam and when i took the shot also i was holding gripping on it too tightly which you'll see in half my comments on my images that's what people are telling me off on and they're absolutely correct and when it's the grip's too tight and the thing the stick was messing with it, it completely put my shot too too much to the left. So I missed a ten yard shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was a lesson, mass like a massive lesson for me. And then the second yeah. second time I went hunting, I got that kill after so much more practice. Um, yeah, I don't know how people can go hunting without practicing. It's that's actually not really ethical. I think it's not mm-hmm. agreed. Mm-mm. Yeah. That is that at least you learned from that first experience though. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It's all about learning. <laughs> Gotta mm-hmm. go through the bad A. Eh? Mm. Absolutely. So I've actually uh I was at a place about four hours from here from where I live, up in the Ozarks, um in, in this part of Arkansas. And I was talking to some guys about bow hunting because I'm not much of an archer myself. I, I really enjoy it, but I haven't got out and done. I've only been bow hunting twice and have never harvested anything. Yeah. Um, but I was talking to them about shooting bows because I recently got mine. I haven't shot mine in years. And uh, they actually gave me a tip that may be helpful to you. And they said, whenever you're holding on to your bow, don't hold on with all your fingers, but just hold on with your pointer finger and your thumb. And basically, you want the pressure to hold the bow to your hand. 
And then also that does one that does two separate things. One of them is you're not holding your bow as tight. Yeah. Secondary to that, you're holding it with your fingers out and it allows the bow to cock ever so slightly, oh. which will stop it from from the whenever you yes. shoot. Have you ever had the oh, fly yes. come and hit you? Sting. So if you only hold on with your top finger, it slightly cocks it to the side and it helps with that where you don't have that interesting okay you know i've tried that and i realized that because my bow is so heavy or at least I'm, my arms are too weak it actually it, 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 i can't really hold it properly you know so it takes a lot of strength so what i've started yeah. doing is going to gym and training my arms just so i can use my <laughs> bow and, um, and and do exactly that yeah so i i have heard about that um, at least with all my tips and hold it very lightly, but I haven't heard it with the pointing mm-hmm. finger and thumb. I might, I might give that a go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Try it out. Let me know how it works for you. I will. Uh, I will. Yeah. But it's crazy how much strength you need, you know, for, for just hunting, even holding a massive rifle, like you really need yeah. strength in your arms. Mm-hmm. And it was my first ever hunt that I did that I realized how intensely fit you have to be to be in the wild. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a person that goes j- to gym every day. I'm a spin class girl fanatic. Um, and my first time hunting, I, th- I think I almost died out of like unfitness. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much respect for hunters because you're carrying your bag of tenting gear, you're carrying your bow or your rifle and you're, hu- you're hiking and you're searching. You're always staying alert for animals. Like it's, it's very hard. Um, and then I was like, okay, I need to train harder for this sport. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have the preparation before the fact. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So you mentioned earlier that you haven't got your rifle license. Have you ever done any type of bird hunting or anything like that? Yeah, so it was duck season that just passed a few months ago. um, And I did try on a few ducks, but they were just too far and there wasn't enough Mm -hmm. there. So that was my first attempt on birds. Um, But I know I haven't done anything since. Yeah. No. So what was your thought on the weight of the shotgun and having to hold it in a upwards angle? Was it, was oh, that a lot for you? That was a lot. That was a lot. I, it's, <laughs> it's so difficult. I cannot believe it. Honestly. Um, it also, cause it's so heavy and the noise, I think I've gone, I went deaf for like <laughs> two, two days <laughs> after that. Um, but it's, it's a completely different sport. And I think for me having su- like just used to bow hunting, it's so quiet and peaceful to using this massive shotgun with like this loud right. bang. I, it didn't really fit too well with me um, yet. I'm still trying to get used to that. That, um, But the deer that I, I just shot a few, a few last weekend, um, that had a suppressor. And I think that would be I my see. way to go if I had to use a gun again. Yeah. Right. Mm, that mm, is awesome. Mm. Yeah. I, the most of the hunting that I've done has actually been bird hunting. We used to do a lot of dove hunting in South Texas and, uh, so that was one thing whenever I first started getting into hunting, I was just like, oh my goodness, when there's so many birds flying and, and you're holding the gun up so long, I felt my arms getting tired and I've always been somewhat fit. You know, I've always been yeah. pretty active and played sports and I was just like, oh, this gun it's is so heavy. So hard. <laughs> it's so hard. You're like, you're exercising different muscles, eh? Oh, absolutely. So different. Yeah. Do you guys eat dove? Oh, dove is so good. Dove season actually starts here in, in about a week. No and way. Um, dove is so good. Really? It, it is one of my favorite game birds to eat. Yeah, dove mm. is like it's like a pigeon, eh? Yeah, it's like a small pigeon. Pigeon is actually really good too. If you get pigeons out in the country, yeah. I wouldn't eat one from the city, but no. yeah, out in the country. <laughs> yeah, they're all in the same family. Interesting, because that would be pretty hard to shoot, especially with them with them flying. It's such small targets, you know. Oh, yeah, it's a challenge, but it's definitely shoot. fun. It's it's another thing that you have to, yeah, it's another thing you have to train for. And so, oh. uh, we do what's called skeet shooting, and to where they'll throw, the, we call them clay pigeons or clays, and they have machines that throw them, or you can throw them by hand, and you have to lead for sure. So if it's flying, you know, left to right, you want to aim in front of it. If it's flying at you, you want to aim above it. Flying away, you have to aim below it. It's you have to lead it for sure. It's it's a whole different game when it comes to hunting, but it is so much fun. That's interesting. Yeah. At, at least like in South Texas or in Texas in general, <clears throat> it's like super popular because it kind of kicks off the hunting season. Because after dove, you have teal and then you have deer, uh, you have duck, you have archery deer. Also, I think that starts in October or something. So just like 
dove season kind of the signals the kickoff of the hunting season. Everybody gets super excited, but they're it, but it's also really cool because it's like it's so different from everything else because you don't really have to be quiet for dove hunting. So mm-hmm. you can like be more vocal. You can you know make fun of your buddies yeah. or whatever. It's just more of like a it's like a <laughs> like a very social style of hunting almost. And I, I've I've oh, known I'm people not- who like have these big like events like they'll invite people to come down to the ranches and like they're barbecuing they're having like like oh. live music after the hunt or not live music but like music after the hunt they're grilling up the dove or making like one popular preparation oh, probably the word. most popular preparation is uh dove poppers which is just a jalapeno cream cheese and you put the the breast on top wrap it in bacon and grill it so good but oh, yeah word. it's probably the most popular Yow. thing so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's incredible but like it's you know people it's like this really big social thing kids can get involved they're usually the ones going fetching the birds and everything and it's just like it's really really cool it's so forgiving um and but it's also really humbling i think the national statistic is somewhere around one bird for every five to seven shells shot or something like that so it's like wow, I mean, it's crazy okay. it's super crazy yeah. but dove hunting yeah, is awesome yeah. it's one of it's one of my favorites yeah, that actually sounds so awesome because hunting is very solo orientated, you know, so when you can do it as like a social get together, which I see a lot of uh, guys do here in New Zealand for duck hunting. It is very mm-hmm. more of a social, but Americans take that extra step, I reckon, with the barbecue, <laughs> with the party, the drink. <laughs> I've always loved, yeah, I've always, um, I've always loved the idea of America. I think just because of your culture, like it's so, celebratory you celebrate everything um yeah and i find it's funny moving to new zealand um i find it very different to south africa incredibly different the culture is so is so so different south african i think was is very more like um like americans we celebrate everything and it's very social and we i don't know you but come to my house and let's celebrate something you know like we're very very warm and inviting where new zealanders we call them kiwis um as much as i love this country also very different you know very it takes time for people to trust you and and bring them into your house and it's very solo and you only have your groups very clicky so it's it, I think that's also an aspect about why it is quite hard doing something, um, getting into something or finding um, information from a lot of people in this country. Um, but yeah, it, it, I'm slowly working my way um, and into a lot of these groups of fishing and hunting and things like that. Whereas Australians is also like you guys, <laughs> very out there and loud and very inviting <laughs> and warm. Um, but yeah, New Zealand is very, very different like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's culture. It's, it is such a, it's such a weird thing, but, um, I think America's definitely, definitely top of my list to go hunting and fishing out for sure. I just have to book the flights, get my visa. Um, yeah, it takes like a eight months or nine months just to get a visa for you to get into your country. Unfortunately, wow. you guys don't that's, like that's quite a bit of a process. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for sure. For sure. But um, it's time. It's time. I'll take my bow with right. me. <laughs> well, you definitely need to make it happen. And if you're ever in the area of Texas or Arkansas, I'm sure Jose and I would love to take you out one way or the other. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things to where there is a lot of differences in terms of culture, but it also depends on where you go. So mm-hmm. how you said, you know, New Zealand was pretty cliquish. That's actually how it is here in Arkansas, too. Really? So I've lived here in Arkansas for five years and majority of my friends here aren't from here. No, it seems like the people right. here are real clickish as well. Yeah. Um, and they just kind of stick to themselves. And if you don't, if you're not associated with somebody in their group, like they're friendly, yeah. they're just not welcoming. They're not going to be like, Hey, come to my house or they're not going to invite you to events and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's taken me about five years to kind of infiltrate some circles to where I can actually go out and do stuff with people. Cause the majority of the time it's like, Hey, you know, we'll talk about, Oh, we're going to go hunting. And uh, yeah, yeah, let's make that happen. And then the next week they're out doing what we were talking about that and I never got the invite. so <laughs> true. That is 100% what happens here in New Zealand. 100%. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Hey. It, it is for sure. And Texas yeah. doesn't seem to be like that. I mean, I can't name how many times. I don't know if y'all, like, do y'all do river tubing there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. A little bit so more like ocean. I'll bump into somebody yeah. on the river 
and bump into them I'm like hey you know how's it going and hand them a beer they hand me a beer and next thing you know two weeks later i'm at their house at a barbecue meeting oh, their grandma like oh my <laughs> word honestly like that is what i love about it is what i've met people from texas i know uh, i know a golfer in texas actually a professional golfer uh-huh. and he tells me all about it he's south african he just says Honestly, the culture just fits in so well there um, because of that warm, inviting, friendly social culture. I think that's what everyone should be like. It's so lovely. Um, But I I guess, I mean, that's why maybe that's why New Zealand does have such a high, high rate of of mental health issues and um, suicide. We're one of the top countries of suicide. And I think Really? really, yeah, it comes down to people feeling very, very lonely you know, especially with the bow hunting community, I, I've come across at least a lot of bow hunters who are, you know, s- severely um, challenged, I would say, which is why they don't have rifle licenses, you know. And I see. yeah, and hunting is the only way that really gets them to clear their mind. Um, so it's, Crazy. yeah, it's been a very interesting community to be a part of because I'm learning so much about mental health and what people are going through which is why a lot of people here are into hunting or fishing. Cause a lot of it, a lot of it just clears their mind of what they're going through in the real world. Um, so I, I'm very, yeah, I'm, I'm very understanding of that side. And, and I think there's definitely something to explore there as well for people as well. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, I, th- I think, I, I think it does come to come down to that. It's just that lack of community and love and zest, you know, which I think um, yeah. a lot of South Africa or, or Texas would have. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, I never knew it was like that over there, but I yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Cause I've, I haven't like quite got to like, you know, suicidal or anything, but I've fallen into mm-hmm. dark times from time to time. Cause it feels like I just don't have anybody. Cause I don't have yeah. any family here or anything. Oh. Uh, my now ex-wife, was the one that moved us up here and then we got divorced and then she moved back to texas oh man and so i'm just it's just me and my daughter up here i don't have anybody wow. and so yeah. now that i'm finally starting to get into some circles it's different but i've kind of fallen into a dark place where it's like i just need to go out and go fishing and that's one yeah. thing about fly fishing is like jose was saying it's everything is intentional and it's kind of helped me you know clear my mind and, and get out there to do a little more but yeah i didn't know that was like a national thing over there in new zealand oh, that's a problem it's such a big problem there's actually i came across this the other day i think it was we have a deer stalkers association um in new zealand and it's something i need to be, actually now be a part of um but they're having an event uh, i think it's called mental health there's, there's a guy that's in the hunting community called mental health something and he's an advocate mm-hmm. for mental health in the hunting community and he's just, he's huge here. I mean, his following and his backing is massive, which is, it, it's sad, but it's good that he's doing yeah. something to change. I mean, oh, I know, absolutely. yeah, I know so many people that are struggling and the first thing that they do is, I mean, I've also been through, you know, some dark times with anxiety and everything. And the first thing you want to do is not talk to anyone, stay indoors, just deal with your own stuff. Mm-hmm. But actually getting out there and just processing that stored energy into into action that was something i learned from something i read online and the moment i did that all of that just left me i just i just did stuff instead of sitting at sitting in it and letting it grow um yeah so i think you know especially after being going through such a terrible breakup in january all of that energy was pent up and i needed to do something and i'm so happy Mm -hmm. hunting and fishing was was a savior for me really to get out there and just process you know being on the rocks for hours and you're not catching anything on your line what do you do you you just think you think you're breathing in the nature which is so healthy good for you there's vitamin Mm -hmm. d from the sun like all of that is so healthy compared to being indoors um so it's it's i think it's definitely changed my own mental health yeah Oh, for sure. And there's just something about being in nature in general, whether it be camping, hiking, oh. just sitting there listening to the water. It is just so therapeutic in numerous ways. Yeah. And it's just so natural. It kind of takes you back to like your inner just humanity just yeah. there existing. And there's really not much to do unless, you know, just the task that's at hand. And so I can definitely see how that would that would help during hard times. And and, uh, you know, and, and the thing, one thing that I kind of thought about whenever you mentioned how you got into hunting and stuff. So it was him that bought you the bow and then you ended up using it 
to kind of get over him. So it's kind <laughs> yeah. of ironic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy because um, <laughs> he, he made a silly decision, of course, and was unfaithful. Um, and that's something mm-hmm. I just not a part of my morals whatsoever. Um, and, yeah. and the, f- the first thing I, you do when you go through a breakup is you've got to, you've got to be distracted. You really do. You've got to get on with your life yeah. and just go, I, I, you know, especially when you're very much in love. Um, and it's like almost like a, you know, all that dopamine's left you all of, it's like a, an adri- like, like a, like a drug really. Um, yeah. and this, this bow was here and, and I said, oh, he was the one that was meant to teach me and help me and use it. I was like, you know what? Bloody get back at him. I'm going to be a master bow hunter. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just That's master awesome. this. Like you have no idea. Um, and yeah, I, and then I started She Hooks and Hunts um, just to, to learn. And it, it grew, it grew very, very quickly, <laughs> um, which that is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Which is amazing to see that. And I, and it's funny, like I, I don't, I don't get a lot of hate comments, which people talk about, or I don't, you know, you do yeah. get a few gross comments from weird guys and everything, which happens mm-hmm. naturally. But I've, I've had so much positive reinforcement and affirmations through this. Like you have no idea, which only pushes you to go further and want to do more. Um, and the help that I've received, I mean, I've just got so much faith and joy out of just seeing people be so friendly and encouraging through this. Um, so it's been a massive part of my healing journey as well. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. What it, you know, it's funny what it, bad things can happen, but there's always got to be an equal positive reaction. It's like a, it's a law of life and it certainly right. has done that. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. I kind of went through a, not a similar situation, but I went through a breakup and went through heartbreak um, in April. And it was kind of yeah. one of those things like we just went on vacation to the Bahamas with her family and, and it was, you know, this great time and, and things kind of came to a head in the Bahamas. And when we got back literally like 30 minutes after we got back is when she left. And so it was kind of one of those things like this, this high and then this oh, big crash. Man. And I was heartbroken. Oh. And first thing that I started doing was going fishing a lot more. And so I took this break oh. because she wasn't into fishing or really like she was into hiking more than anything, but she mm. didn't like fishing or hunting or anything like mm. that. So I went, you know, the whole time we were together, I didn't really fish much. And so the first thing I did is like, I'm going to go and I'm going to do everything that she didn't like. And so <laughs> similarly, I went out and the, yeah. like not too long after we got back, like I caught, it was a couple of days after I caught this massive, like 35 pound carp on the fly oh and it was awesome. God. And then I started just going and fishing a lot more and I caught like a almost four foot gar and just like what? all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and it was very similar. Like I was like, I'm going to get back at her cause I never got to go fishing when I was with her and I'm just going fishing all the time now. And just, it helped me, you know, yeah. really get over a lot of stuff and started, you know, getting out there a lot more than I had in the previous years. So it was uh, definitely it was yeah. definitely nice and helped me heal. <laughs> yeah, and it's I think it's the best way to do it, right? You make something of that pain and you just Absolutely. Yeah, cuz I've seen so many people that don't make something of their pain and it eats them alive, it does, you know. Yeah. And and that's really what leads to the more intense mental health issues and everything. I mean, oh, I sure. Yeah, I, I've I've been through a whirlwind of things. Um but that was definitely one of the hardest. And I promise you now, if it weren't for fishing and hunting, my life would have been very different. Um, so, yeah, I'm very happy. But you mentioned carp. So we've got carp here in, in New Zealand, which actually is a pest. and No one really eats it apart from certain cultures. Mm-hmm. Is it the same carp that I'm thinking about? Like they've got they look almost like catfish. Yeah, kind of. They have have these like little barbels off the yeah. corner of the mouth. And, yeah. So, yeah, we so we have numerous species of carp here. Uh, we have <clears throat> the common carp and we have grass carp. We have Asian carp and they're invasive. Um, mm-hmm. Some of them are like naturalized. It depends on like the density of the population, and stuff like that. Some of them, there's orders in states like if you see one, kill it type of thing. Um, but in terms of table fare, they're not. Yeah, a lot of people don't eat them. I've actually yeah. never eaten them, but I, I do practice a lot of catch and release yeah. um, if it's not in an area to where there's too many of them and there's not a kill order. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, typically mm-hmm. I just... I normally catch and release them, uh, but they're just massive fish. So I really enjoy catching them on a fly rod because yeah. the fight is fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they're just really fun. Interesting. Cause it's quite a huge thing in the bow hunter community where we go bow fishing mm-hmm. for them. And because yeah. they're so oily, they make incredible burly. 
So you create a burley out of it and then put it at the back of your boat when you're going deep sea fishing. And apparently it attracts like really good fish to the boat I see. because of the oils. So that's my yeah. next, that's my next adventure is going bow fishing for all the carp here, which are such a pest in New Zealand. So you're doing such a favor for the hmm. ecosystems and the rivers. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be posting that and making a video of that soon. <laughs> That mm-hmm. is awesome. That's nice. one thing that I never thought about. I mean, because there's a lot of people here that will bow fish them and then they just throw them on the bank and leave them. And <gasps> I'm real big on like utilizing what you kill. I don't like yes. just killing stuff just because. And there are a lot of bow fishers here. We actually, I think it was like the second episode we ever did on this podcast. We talked about bow fishing. Yeah. And a lot of people will just, they do it because it's fun to do, which I can't deny that, Mm -hmm. but they just kill them and leave them. And there's a fish here. It's actually an indigenous species, but it's not a game fish. So it's not really regulated Mm -hmm. uh, called a red horse sucker. And they are a blast to catch. They're hard to catch, but they're fun to catch, but they bow fish them here a lot. And they literally just shoot them, take the arrow out and throw it back in the water. And and they'll just decimate populations. And they're (gasps) indigenous fish. They're from here, No, but there's no regulations on them. So they do it just because it's fun. And I just don't agree with that. Like even if you're using it to feed your dogs or something like that, like if you're doing something with it, do it. But to hear that y'all are doing that over there for deep sea fishing, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's really awesome. The only thing is it's so difficult to, um, to, to obviously make the burley because, you know, I've got a city home and, you know, it needs to smell nice and look nice. It's a city (laughs) home. Like I don't, I don't own a farm or whatever. Um, so making burley is quite a fishy, smelly job, you know, as long as you know someone that can do the burley for you, but I, I could never just go ahead and, kill all these fish and not use it like that's so what what a waste you know um there's a lot of people that do it here unfortunately that's so bad that's so so bad yeah i hear stories about that all the time of hunters killing beautiful beautiful red stags during the raw which is uh, Mm um early and early in the year and the raw, of course, their antlers are bigger and better than ever. So they just cut the heads off, take the antlers, and the meat's not really the best to eat. So they just leave the whole body just there and like wow, not, wow. not utilizing it, nothing. I just couldn't do that. Yeah. Mm. We have a little bit of that going on here, but we also have some people that will shoot a deer and then they just take the back strap off of it oh, yeah. and leave it at that. Like they just get what they think is the best part of the meat and then leave the rest. Oh. And to me, that's just very irresponsible. Like, yeah. I'm the type I want to try to use everything. And and even like gar, do y'all have garfish there? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard of it. No. So we have different types of gar here. There's alligator gar, which get like eight feet long. And they're, Whoa. they're truly like dinosaurs. They have not evolved much throughout, you know, since they've existed. <laughs> um, But they're yeah. just, they have these massive teeth and just extremely sharp hundreds of teeth. And they're, Whoa. they're fun to catch. Yeah. Uh, but there's different species. There's alligator gar and spotted gar, short nose gar, long nose gar, all different kinds of gar. Yeah. And they're a trash fish. And a lot of people, it's another fish that people mm-hmm. blow fish and they just kill and leave off to the side. Oh. Um, but I've actually heard of some people eating them and they're, so they, their scales are armored. So Ooh. they're a very tough, tough fish. And so they're hard to clean and their skin is like leather with scales on it. It's insane. Oh, it's, it's the craziest thing. I want to read You have to use books. like clippers. <laughs> right. You have to use like clippers to get through their skin. Yeah. Um, but I've heard of people taking their meat and processing it like, like deer meat through a grinder and making like crab patties out of them. And yeah. apparently it's really good to eat no that way. No way. It's like with the scales and yeah. everything. No, 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 no. They they take the skin and the scales, just remove the meat. Yeah. No, that's, oh, I couldn't even imagine. Because the scales, they're actually sharp enough that they can cut you. They're like arms. No ways. Yeah. They're a very interesting creature. Interesting. (laughs) I'm going to research that after this (laughs) because I've never heard of that before. Yeah. There's been records of some indigenous cultures that that they will actually use the, uh, the scales as arrowheads for the arrows. To hunt with what the hell that is crazy i i would be so interested in actually making my own like hunting equipment yeah with just like nature yeah there's this uh someone sent me this the other day you can make this bow thing from bamboo because bamboo is so strong and actually it, like it, it can mm-hmm. penetrate quite far um there's so many things you can do with just what's around you I think traveling to Australia and doing like a road trip there and just utilizing what you have on the land and maybe with like you take one bit of fishing line and just use what you have. I think that would be a really interesting documentary to have. 
and just live on it. Oh, for sure. So there's all these things I want to do, but I can't just stay on an island by myself. Like, there's no way. So I'd have to bring, like, (laughs) you know, a friend or something. (laughs) But, yeah, that would be really cool. Mm-hmm. So kind of feeding off of what Jose said about making arrowheads and stuff, I think there's actually other um like tribes and stuff that would use the gar scales to make jewelry and stuff like that too. Like and it, it is a very interesting, it almost has like this iridescence to it. So it's it's pretty cool to look at. Um but yeah, there's many uses, you know, and I'm yeah. a firm believer in using everything that you can. So. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, jewelry, now we're talking. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I try, like, obviously we do that with shells and stuff, but actually from the animals mm. that you can get, like the antlers, like imagine like moose antlers or whatever um, to make chandeliers, you know, fr- from yeah. them. I've seen those. Those are beautiful. Really awesome. We have some people here in the States that'll go and, and they'll go shed hunting and, and find shed antlers and they'll take them and they'll they'll arrange them to make like a christmas tree and so it'll be eight foot tall and it's just nothing what? but just antlers all around it yeah no it's pretty ways. cool okay that's cool that's that's like they're probably true hunters <laughs> to have an antler oh, christmas sure. tree yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah people that'll go out there and and when it's not hunting season they're out looking for the antlers that have been shed by the deer and they're they're just constantly in the woods and it it's kind of like a, a multifaceted thing because not only are you gathering stuff that comes from the animal that you love but secondary to that you can be scouting and see where they're bedding up see where they're nesting and just get to know the animal more get to know the region more so there's not reasons to not do it so So it definitely makes sense but yeah there's some people that are like do a lot of stuff with crazy sheds that they find yeah that i can imagine so so cool and also they make great dog bones (laughs) you know get the dog to chew on it so clever yeah because i mean people pay so much for dog treats and everything but as a hunter mm-hmm. you've just got all of that access to you you know in the wild yeah um which is something that's so new to me really i'm I'm so like five months in and there's so much to explore further and i'm so excited for the summer coming up because new zealand summer is coming up within you know next next month is our first month of spring and then it's I see. pure fishing and hunting season with minimal rain, good sun, and I'm I'm excited, super excited. That I'm actually getting awesome. yeah. So y'all's hunting season is during the summer. Um, so I think it's all year round mainly, all year round. I but I guess it's a lot easier because um, camping in the snow is not best. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, and I think it's a lot. Yeah having less clothes to carry and less jackets and things like that it's just yeah. so much easier so i'm looking forward That's to crazy. that yeah. yeah yeah so right now we're at the very beginning of fall and fall like jose was saying like dove kicks off the hunting season then you get to duck and stuff like that but all of our hunting seasons are winter time interesting uh, yeah. i mean look we, pr- we don't hunt in the summer Okay. Well, look, it's probably, I mean, I, I've obviously being a beginner, I don't know when the best seasons are for which. So, um, yes, I'm still trying to learn that as well. Um, but I guess for Bo, it would be easier, especially being so yeah. cold, you know. Hope- so y'all don't have yeah. like regulations on certain dates that you can and can't hunt. No. Do you? Really? Yeah. That's yeah. Crazy. Like, so when we talked about kicking off season, so we cannot oh, yeah. shoot a dove until September 7th. No, we, we can't. We can't even go hunting for them. That's yeah. terrible. Same thing like with bear. I think September eighteenth or something like that is the first day that bear season opens. You can't even take take a bow or a rifle out with you in the woods until. No then. ways. I mean, it, yeah. it's good that they have those regulations, but that's crazy. That's really crazy. No, in New Zealand, we can hunt any any time, anywhere, any day, as long as we really? actually, yeah, as long as we go on, especially if we're going on dock land, hmm. which is public land, we do just hmm. need to sign one sheet to say to, do, to the government, okay, we will be hunting in this area during this time. That's all you need to do. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. yeah no, we, I mean, we have regulations depending on what size wow. caliber you can use, uh, when you can use it. Like, for instance, wow. they started a new, they call it, um, alternative weapons or something like that here in Arkansas to where you can only use a uh, certain cartridges or you can use like an atlatl or a bow or something like that or a spear. No. Um, and that's going to be like really early. It's like a weekend thing or maybe it's a week long thing. And then it goes to archery season and then it goes to muzzle loader season and then it goes to modern gun season. Like it's real. There's certain dates you can do certain things and it doesn't last that long at all. Like, some seasons are only, or some like sections of the season are only a weekend. 
No uh, some of them are a week. Wait, yeah. uh, that's terrible. So you really have to wait only for a few for your days to do your hunt. No, yeah. especially I, if you have a full time job and everybody yeah. else is out there on the weekends mm-hmm. because they're working during the week. So yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely a challenge. I didn't know that it was wide open like that over there. Oh, it's totally wide. This is even more of a reason why you guys should come visit. <laughs> right, I'm hundred, definitely going to make that happen. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And the good thing is now I've got those connections to some properties and to areas where I know, you know, well, well, I'm learning to know where the good areas are yeah. so um and that's the thing right you just got it it's who you know in life not what you know most of the time exactly. <laughs> so when you guys do come over oh my word we can definitely plan a really sick hunt um on on whatever species really you're, you're wanting to target that would be awesome yeah, yeah new zealand has been on my list to travel for probably 15 years now i've always wanted to go over there and now that I'm getting more into fly fishing, I've heard that fly fishing over there is so great. Yeah. And then now to hear that there's like far less hunting regulations, like I could definitely do a hunting <laughs> and fishing trip and go. Like it's yeah. definitely moving higher and higher on my list. <laughs> yeah, get out like maybe three weeks and uh, oh my gosh, this land is your own, you know, get a camper van. Oh, and, that would be awesome. Yeah, travel. I'm definitely going to have to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, definitely do it during uh, summer for sure. Yeah, especially for the so what, what when does y'all summer start? So summer starts so it's the spring, September, October, November. Summer really starts December, January, February, March. Um, okay. Yeah, so December and January. Oh, I am targeting a marlin. I'm targeting my big <laughs> shark. Like it is happening, um, and it's yeah, it's so fun because days are longer. The sun sets later. It's it's really a life. You know, you want to live. I work nine to five, so in winter, you know, it gets dark at like five thirty six, and that's your day. But now in summer, it will be getting dark at like eight p.m. So I've got at least four hour window to go fishing after work, um, and I will be getting like a, a little boat, which is good. Very soon, um, a company has approached me and, and wanting to sponsor that to me, which is such a blessing, you know. Um, so I'm going to be, awesome. yeah, yeah. So I'll be oh, fishing literally every, every day, <laughs> every day. That is so cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try to plan a time to be there oh, between God. sometime December and April. <laughs> yes, do it. I'll have my boat by then. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> awesome. It has been absolutely amazing having you on and I've learned so much. So if you ever want to hop on again, we would love to have you. It's been a great conversation, and I feel like there's a lot more that we could dive into. Yeah, 100%, guys. You guys are amazing. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm it has really been a blast. It. Thank you so yeah, much for spending your time with us today. Of course. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Let's definitely do it again. Awesome. Well, thank you. Oh, for, for sure. And for those of y'all that are watching, thank y'all for making it to the end, and we will catch y'all next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.